There are numerous myths and legends passed down since remote antiquity concerning an ancient long-lost civilization that allegedly existed before a time of great cataclysm, which some say originated somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean, but most certainly had colonies all around the world as part of its expansive empire. We often hear mythologies that speak to a forgotten parent race which were revered as gods and that taught various communities of tribal people about agriculture, astronomy, architecture, art, and spirituality. While many people point to places like Egypt, India, and Tibet, these are not the only places which hold clues to a forgotten past which may differ from the accepted history we're all taught in modern anthropology classrooms. As one of the seven wonders of the natural world, the Grand Canyon is a true national treasure. Carved by the Colorado River in Arizona, this steep-sided canyon is 277 miles long, up to 18 miles wide, and attains a depth of over a mile. For thousands of years, the area has been continuously inhabited by Native Americans, who built settlements within the canyon and its many caves. The Pueblo people considered the Grand Canyon a holy site and made pilgrimages to it. The first academically accepted Europeans known to have viewed the Grand Canyon was in 1540, but this may not be the case as there are many unusual stories associated with this area, some published and some passed down orally. The Hopi Indians maintained that their ancestors did not arrive from the north over a land bridge from Asia, nor do they believe that they arrived to the New World by boat, but instead, their origin myths tell the story of how they climbed onto the surface from the underworld. The specific location where the Hopi claim they emerged from took place in their legends deep inside the Grand Canyon an enchanted opening from the mysterious recesses of the earth. Native American folklore states that the Grand Canyon was formed as a result of a great deluge which had drowned the previous third world, and Hopi cosmology specifies that this canyon was the exact place where the Hopi emerged from their subterranean refuge after a great flood had destroyed the previous age. There are several inner world entry points that are said to be located on their land in the canyon. One of them is very revered and honored in ceremony as the dwelling of an ancient parent race. And this sacred site is strictly off limits to all but the Hopi people themselves. The lore further claims that the Hopi were assisted by what they describe as an ant people who lived in the inner world in the caves and caverns, and they're described by some elders as being pale humanoids with thin limbs, slightly arched backs, and people working for the Smithsonian may also have actually discovered artifacts inside some massive caverns with intricate passages, rooms that include tables with hieroglyphs, and was actually an article published in the Arizona Gazette on April 5th, 1909, that states that the Grand Canyon was once home to a lost civilization that consisted of people of gigantic proportions, or giants. It also mentions the discovery of an enormous underground citadel, which was discovered in the Marble Canyon region of the Grand Canyon by a pair of Smithsonian-funded archaeologists, S.A. Jordan and G.E. Kincaid who came upon it while rafting on the Colorado River in a wooden boat. Keep in mind that they did not claim to be employees of the Smithsonian, but freelance contractors, which was not uncommon for the Smithsonian to have. The alleged entrance to the city was at the end of a tunnel that stretched almost a mile underground, and they didn't just claim to discover ancient artifacts or treasure, but a lost Egyptian civilization deep beneath the Grand Canyon. According to the story related to the Gazette by Mr. Kincaid, 
nearly 1,480 feet below the surface, there's a long main passage that splits off into a mammoth chamber from which several other passages radiate out, like spokes on a wheel. Kincaid claims that several hundred rooms have been discovered, reached by passageways running from the main passage, one of them having been explored for 854 feet and another for 634 feet. Inside some of these rooms were artifacts that do not seem native to the Americas, including weapons of war, copper instruments with sharp edges that indicate a high state of civilization to construct them. According to Kincaid, in his own words, quote, First, I would impress that the cavern is nearly inaccessible. The entrance is 1,486 feet down the sheer canyon wall. It is located on government land, and no visitor will be allowed there under penalty of trespass. I was journeying down the Colorado River in a boat looking for mineral. Some 42 miles up the river from the El Tavor Crystal Canyon, I saw on the east wall stains in the sedimentary formation about 2,000 feet above the river bed. There was no trail to this point, but I finally reached it with great difficulty. Above the shelf which hid it from view from the river was the mouth of the cave. There are steps leading from this entrance some 30 yards to what was, at the time the cavern was inhabited, the level of the river. When I saw the chisel marks on the wall inside the entrance, I became interested, securing my gun and went in. During that trip, I went back several hundred feet along the main passage till I came to the crypt in which I discovered the mummies. One of these I stood up and photographed by flashlight. The main passage is about 12 feet wide, narrowing to 9 feet towards the farther end. About 57 feet from the entrance, the first side passages branch off to the right and left, along which, on both sides, are a number of rooms about the size of ordinary living rooms of today. Some are 30 to 40 feet square. These are entered by oval-shaped doors and are ventilated by round air spaces through the walls into the passages. The walls are about 3 feet 6 inches in thickness. The passages are chiseled or hewn as straight as could be laid out by an engineer. The ceilings of many of the rooms converge to a center. The side passages near the entrance run at a sharp angle from the main hall, but towards the rear they gradually reach a right angle in direction. Over a hundred feet from the entrance is the cross hall, several hundred feet long, in which are found the idol, or image, of the people's god, sitting cross-legged, with a lotus flower, or lily, in each hand. The idol almost resembles Buddha, though the scientists are not certain as to what religious worship it represents. Taking into consideration everything found thus far, it is possible that this worship most resembles the ancient people of Tibet. Surrounding this idol are smaller images, some very beautiful in form. All this is carved out of hard rock resembling marble. In the opposite corner of this cross hall were found tools of all descriptions made of copper. These people undoubtedly knew the lost art of hardening this metal. On a bench running around the workroom was some charcoal and other material probably used in the process. There's also slag and stuff similar to mat, showing that these ancients smelted ores, but so far no trace of where or how this was done has been discovered, nor the origin of the ore. Among the other finds are vases or urns and cups of copper and gold, made very artistic in design. The pottery work includes enameled ware and glazed vessels. Another passageway leads to the granaries, such are found in the oriental temples. They contain seed of various kinds. One very large storehouse has not yet been entered, as it is 12 feet high and can be reached only from above. These granaries are rounded, as the materials of which they are constructed, I think, is very hard cement. A gray metal is also found in this cavern, 
which puzzles scientists for its identity has not yet been established. It resembles platinum. On all the urns or walls over doorways and tablets of stone which were found by the image are the mysterious hieroglyphics, the key to which the Smithsonian Institute hopes yet to discover. The engravings on the tables probably has something to do with the religion of the people. Similar hieroglyphics have been found in southern Arizona. The tomb or crypt in which the mummies were found is one of the largest of the chambers, the wall slanting back at an angle of about 35 degrees. On these are tiers of mummies, each one occupying a separate hewn shelf. At the head of each is a small bench on which is found copper cups and pieces of broken swords. Some of the mummies are covered with clay and all are wrapped in a bark fabric. Upwards of 50,000 people could have lived in the caverns comfortably. One theory is that the present Indian tribes found in Arizona are descendants of the serfs or slaves of the people which inhabited the cave. Undoubtedly, a good many thousands of years before the Christian era, a people lived here which reached a high stage of civilization. The chronology of human history is full of gaps. Could the Hopi Indian myths have been based in fact? Some have speculated that they might have been specially bred as a slave race and later rebelled and escaped to become some of the Native American peoples we know today. With a reputable paper running the story, Tales of this lost civilization caught on in the region. If true, it would make it not only one of the oldest archaeological discoveries in the United States, but one of the most profound and valuable in the world. Over the past century, numerous archaeologists have planned to go searching for this mythical world, but exploration of internal caverns and caves are off limits and forbidden by law. If an Atlantis-like settlement did ever exist, underground, within the canyon, could there still be civilizations that exist deep beneath the earth? And if so, where are these entrances to these inner worlds, and who could possibly inhabit them? John Wesley Powell was the first person to travel the entire Colorado River and explored the Grand Canyon from 1896 to 1872, and this was before the Gazette article was published. In his book, Explorations of the Colorado River and its Canyons, he writes, quote, In this, great numbers of caves are hollowed out, and carvings are seen which suggest architectural forms, though on a scale so grand that architectural terms belittle them. As this great bed forms a distinctive feature of the canyon, we call it Marble Canyon. I walk down the gorge to the left at the foot of the cliff, climb to a bench, and discover a trail deeply worn into the rock, where it crosses the side, gulches in some places, steps have been cut. I can see no evidence of it having been traveled for a long time. It was doubtless a path used by people who inhabited this country anterior to the present Indian races, the people who built the communal houses of which mention has been made. I return to camp about three o'clock and find that some of the men have discovered ruins and many fragments of pottery, also etchings and hieroglyphics on the rocks. That said, the Smithsonian has denied the validity of the claims published in 1909, but as I've pointed out in a previous video that I made regarding dozens of other independent discoveries of giant skeletons discovered in America during the early 20th and 19th century. None of these finds published in papers such as the New York Times can be accounted for either. So there's plenty of precedent for the Smithsonian losing artifacts or information about discoveries that do not fit in with currently accepted dogma about the history of America and its interaction with other ancient civilizations. But why would the Smithsonian cover up something like this? Because it would change the entire history of North America as we know it, and would not align with the how history was written up in the textbooks, which promote a certain political agenda. Modern-day archaeologists 
largely dismiss anything remotely related to any stories like this because it's not what universities teach. It's funny that just because something isn't written in the officially approved curriculum, it's discounted as false. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon. My books make a great gift. If you'd like to support my work, you could do that through patreon.com. There should be a link in the description section for those who are interested. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Please hit the like button and don't forget to subscribe for future updates. As always, I look forward to reading your thoughts. So please leave me a comment below. Please have a wonderful week and I hope to see you again soon.